she uh, sacrificed her time tonight to participate with us in the program. And thank you much, Dr. Hoda, for your time. Efficiently, you are the one of the cornerstone in this program, to be honest with you. Uh, we are on the YouTube at the moment. I will give you the link here of YouTube. If you kindly uh, share it with your colleagues who are not able to join the program, uh, the uh, YouTube is on uh, the chat box. Uh, you can send it to your uh, colleagues now. And uh, we are going to start our webinar in less than a minute. So in less than a minute, I will uh, will start and uh, give the floor uh, um, to Dr. Hoda to start the program. Uh, we we starting point with a very good number of colleagues. Uh, the uh, uh, YouTube people will uh, Sorry, the chat box. But, uh, you can is, send uh, where I am now. I think that something wrong happened here. Okay. Uh, it is off now. Yeah. Uh, everything is okay. Hello, hello. Everything is okay. Yes, we yeah. can hear you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Hoda, for your time. Dr. Hoda Fauzi is the moderator of this webinar tonight, and thank you so much. Dr. Hoda is graduated from Alexandria University. She is uh, one of the staff, and uh, she has earned her MD in anesthesiology, <laughs> and her MD in anesthesiology one at. Um, Hotmail.com. Uh, um, uh, Dr. Hoda is a role model anesthesiologist and researcher and a clinician in anesthesia. Uh, I would like to uh, give her the floor tonight to introduce those top panelists tonight in uh, this big learning webinar. Thank you very much for Dr. Hoda. Uh, thank you, thank you, Dr. Saad, for the introduction. Uh, welcome, everybody, um, uh, colleagues. Uh, panelists, uh, lecturers, and attendees. Uh, tonight, we're going to start one of our uh, new webinars uh, in the MEGA Learning. We have two um, uh, important lectures today. Uh, let's start first with uh, Professor John Doyle. Uh, professor uh, John Doyle, he is a professor of anesthesiology in Cleveland Clinic. Uh, Case Western uh, Reserve University, USA, and he's going to give us today a lecture about um, an update in drug safety and anesthesiology. Uh, Dr. John, can you start, please? Okay, so let's share the screen. And thank you, everybody, for the opportunity to present on a topic that is very important, and that is drug safety. A good place to start in the discussion of drug safety goes back to the 1950s with a drug called thalidomide. This was a drug marketed to the public in 1957 as a wonder drug for insomnia, for, for colds, coughs, and headaches, and it became licensed in the UK and elsewhere. In 1961, several years later, William McBride, an Australian doctor, noticed that there was an increased number of deformed babies at his hospital, all to mothers who had taken thalidomide and thereby the connection was made that thalidomide would cause damage to unborn babies. And the drug was withdrawn in November of that year. Here's the focomilia that we see as a result of the thalidomide. And there was a whole cohort of children born that required special care as a consequence of this, all from the drug thalidomide. In 1962, the Food and Drug Administration Inspector Francis Kelsey received an award from President John F. Kennedy for blocking the sale of thalidomide in the United States. And this was one of the great triumphs of the United States Food and Drug Administration in that uh, they did not approve the drug when it was applied and they saved many, many thousands of babies from focomilia. Let's consider some of the other horror stories that you may have encountered in your clinical experience. Here's one where three mil mLs or 30 milligrams of rocuronium instead of three milligrams of rocuronium were given as a defaciculating dose to an awake patient. We don't 
do defasciculation as much as it was done in the past, in part because we don't use succinylcholine that much anymore. Um, but you can see that this immediately required that the patient be put off to sleep as soon as it was recognized that they'd given the wrong drug. Another uh, drug error that I noticed in my clinical career, uh, this happened in our post-anesthetic care unit many years ago, instead of three units of insulin to treat hyperglycemia, 300 units or three mLs were given. In, in this case, the error was recognized more or less instantly and serial glucometer measurements plus serial boluses of glucose uh, ended up with the result that the patient was not harmed in the least. In another story, 200 milligrams of morphine were given in a post-anesthetic care unit or recovery room by virtue of a pump runaway, PC, PCA being patient-controlled analgesia due to a hardware failure. So basically the pump kept giving, giving, and giving more uh, drug than it should have, resulting of course uh, in a respiratory arrest that in this case was recognized and treated. Here's another story, this from the Institute for Safe Medical Practices. On the left, you can see a bag of heparin and on the right, a bag of head of starch. And in this particular story, instead of giving the 6% head of starch, the patient received 25,000 units of heparin in this bag. And of course, the anticoagulation had to be treated. Here's another story, this one from Canada. Fatal outcome after inadvertent injection of epinephrine intended for topical use. And it's worthwhile taking a look at this. Here's the incident. During a day surgery ENT procedure, the surgeon requested local anesthesia for injection, lidocaine 1% with epinephrine 1 in 100,000. And this is universal. It's used around the world. He was handed a pre-drawn syringe and he injected medication to the surgical site. Immediately afterward, the patient experienced cardiac arrhythmia leading to cardiac arrest. And despite full resuscitation measures, the patient died. So here is uh, an uh, ampule or vial of uh, epinephrine, uh, 30 ml uh, in uh, 30 milligrams, 30 mLs, and it's for topical application only. In this case, it got injected because of, of a medication error. Another sad tragedy, the epidural injection of 15 mLs of 15% potassium chloride when the potassium chloride was mistaken for distilled water and used as a diluent for bupivacate. The patient's physiological reaction was immediate and severe, resulting in permanent paraplegia and then death six months later. Another story relates to this movie star, Dennis Quaig, a medical mistake nearly killed his twin infants and put him on a personal crusade relating to the reduction of drug errors. So three infants at one of the most reputable hospitals in California received a thousand times more heparin than intended when vials containing 10,000 units per ml instead of 10 units per ml were used in error <coughs> to flush the infant's vascular access lines. No doubt the intense media attention given to these errors is related to the fact that two of the infants were the newborn twins of Hollywood celebrities, Dennis and Kimberly Quaid. And so that affected them quite a bit. And they went on a mission to try and improve drug safety. Pharmacy technicians accidentally placed vials containing the more concentrated heparin, 10,000 units per ml in storage locations in patient care areas designed for less concentrated heparin. And that would be 10 units per ml. Vials containing the different strengths of heparin actually look similar. So the nurses who were accustomed to finding only the 10 units per ml concentration of heparin did not notice the error until after the wrong concentration had been used to flush the infant's access lines. So on the left, you can see the heparin at 10 units per hour. And immediately to the right of that, you can see the heparin in darker blue at 10,000 units per ml. And of course, it was the uh, second of these that was given instead of the 10 units per ml and resulted in complications for the patient. So this resulted in Dennis Quigg uh, wanting to uh, initiate a program to uh, prevent drug errors. And so this was in the news quite a bit. Uh, and it also led to a lot of people being interested in this problem of drug errors. Uh, and one of the uh, places most interested in this was the Institute of Medicine that issued a report 
called Preventing Medication Errors. The reference is down below, and it was published in 2007. They estimated that 1.5 million preventable adverse drug reactions occur annually in the United States, and of course, more around the world. Another study estimated that 530,000 preventable adverse drug events occur each year among outpatient Medicare benefits, Medicare being the system for universal health care for the elderly and the infirm. The annual cost of treating preventable adverse drug reactions in the Medicare system for enrollees age 65 and older is estimated at $887 million based on available data at the time. So this came from the Institute of Medicine and instituted a lot of interest in the problem of initiating programs to reduce drug errors. Take a look at this prescription. Does anybody have a guess what it actually says? This is a real world order that came by. And if you look at it carefully, you might be able to see that this is for morphine 10 milligrams IM. It is problems like this that have led to a lot of hospitals using electronic ordering. And in uh, the hospital I operate on, um, it turns out that uh, all our orders are electronic or verbal, but I haven't done a written air, uh, air order uh, in memory now, it must've been at least five or 10 years. One of the things about writing orders by hand is that there are some potential errors that can occur because of dangerous abbreviation symbols and dose designations. This is from the Institute for Safe Medication Practices in Canada. And here are some of the error prone abbreviations I'd bring to your mind. Abbreviation of U for unit is not a good idea because it's sometimes mistaken for zero. So alternative is write out unit in longhand. IU is sometimes mistaken for IV, so write international units in longhand. QD mistaken for QID, so write daily instead. And similarly for QOD, you should write every other day. Similarly, you want to avoid trailing uh, uh, zeros after a drug. You don't want to say 5.0 milligrams because they may not see the decimal point and, and, and expect to give 50 milligrams as an example. So these are all things that are recommended to reduce the likelihood in um, uh, error in uh, orders that are written uh, by hand. Here's another interesting uh, study called the July effect. The study identifies a spike in fatal medication errors when new residents arrive, which in the United States is typically every July. And in this study published in the Journal of General Internal Medicine, fatal medication errors spiked as much as 10% in July inside medical institutions in the US counties that contain teaching hospitals. And this spike is informally known as the July effect or the new resident hypothesis. So the idea here is that medication errors are more likely with individuals who are just new to a particular system. So three themes emerged during the course of this study. Fatal medication errors spiked in July and in no other month. The July spike appeared only in counties containing teaching hospitals, but not in regular hospitals that don't have residents. And in these counties, July mortality from medication errors was 10% above the expected level. So that's a training issue, of course, and many hospitals are taking that into account. Another challenge is drugs that sound alike. For example, morphine and hydromorphone uh, are similar enough that they account for about three and a half percent of wrong drug errors. In this case, some 295 reports came through to regulatory authorities. Other ones is oxycodone and oxycontin, 2.2 percent, and uh, clonazepam and clonidine, 0.6 percent, and so on. So a lot of these sound the same, and that can be a problem, particularly when giving verbal orders. So it's suggested in some cases that when a prescription is written, particularly in family practice, that one include a drugs indication on the prescription as a safety measure. So you can just check off what the appropriate uh, clinical condition is. So if it's unclear uh, whether a prescription says Celebrex or Serapix, a checkbox in the musculoskeletal box would suggest that it's Celebrex as the desired drug. Of course, in electronic prescriptions where it's all typed and checked uh, electronically, this is less of a problem. 
Another challenge is lookalike drugs. And on the top, you can see two drugs that look very much alike. On the right, you can see a, a number of ophthalmic solutions that look the same. And on the bottom, on the bottom left, you have morphine two milligrams per ml on the top and morphine four milligrams per ml on the bottom. And they look very similar as well. Hydromorphone one milligram per ml on the top and on the right, hydromorphone two milligrams per ml on the bottom. And these are obvious sources of confusion that regulatory authorities have to deal with. Yeah, here's a case example. There's Novolog 7030 and Novolin 7030, and they're not the same product. So you can see it's very easy to make a mistake like that. Here is a polyamp ampule containing bupivacaine, but they're labeled with the company's brand name, Sensorcane, rather than the generic name bupivacaine. So one of the things that I'll get into later is the importance that all drugs um, have labeled with them, at least their generic name, uh, and here that uh, has not been uh, followed. Uh, another error here, the pharmacy placed an isoprel or isoproteranol ampule in the low presser ampules section of the cardiac support floor stock. The isoprel was removed from the stock and administered to a patient. Both products have the same blue stripe on the ampule and look rather similar. Another thing that is sometimes confusing is the dosage concentration. Here, it's uh, suggested that it's one in 5,000 rather than indicating the drug in milligrams directly. Now, there are a number of potential errors in drug delivery that will interest you. It's repeatedly said over thousands of years that to err is part of being human. And here, for example, from uh, uh, a text in uh, 1635, I presume you're mortal and may err. In Pope's essay on criticism, to err is human to forgive divine. Sanders, who is an authority on human error, writes, to err is human, to forgive is against company policy, going on to comment that taking into account the nature of human error is very important in human factors activities. So here is John Sanders commenting again, all of the above quotations that we saw earlier state that errors will be made by people despite their determination to avoid them. Yet people are consistently held accountable for their errors when they lead to accidents with adverse outcomes. Is this proper? I argue that it is not in the same way that in law, no one is held accountable for acts of God. So this is Sender's position on this, and it is characteristic of a new way of thinking about human error that takes a look at the system rather than the individual. So, one of the things that industry has been concerned about for quite some time is human errors uh, in industrial accidents. And now a lot of that information has been used to understand human error in hospitals. Mm -hmm. So General Electric, Motorola, others have all reported complex programs that resulted in a marked reduction in the frequency of worker injuries. And the question is, can we do the same for hospitals? In the field of medicine, however, with the outstanding exception of anesthesiology, there's a paucity of information Many reports referring to a 1984 Harvard, New York State study, and the scarcity of information, according to this source, indicates the complexity of the problem. But fortunately, because of an interest in this, there's been a renewal of interest on this very topic. Uh, it seems very unlikely that simple exhortation or additional regulations will help because the Problem lies principally in the multiple human machine interfaces that constitute modern medical care. It's not simply a matter of offering more penalties. Concurrent with the studies of industrial and nuclear accidents, cognitive psychologists have intensively studied how the brain stores and retrieves information and several concepts relevant to this have emerged. First, errors are not a character defect to be treated by a classical approach of discipline education, shaming, but are products of normal thinking that occur frequently. Second, major accidents are rarely caused by a single error. Instead, they're often a combination of chronic system errors termed latent errors. And identifying and correcting these latent errors should be the principal focus for creative planning rather than searching for an individual culprit and blaming everything on them. In this regard, it's helpful to understand the difference between slips and mistakes. 
And this comes from research from Reason and Devon. Slips are errors in execution and mistakes are errors in planning and action. And we'll have some examples. When is a, an action a slip or a mistake? Consider this scenario. Pressing the red rather than the blue button leads to an unwanted consequence. So if the correct intention was to press the blue button, then the action was a slip. If the intention was to press the red button, then the action was a mistake. So what kind of comments can we make about human error in medicine in general? Here are some classifications that can be helpful. In the case of a diagnostic process, failure to employ indicated tests misleading uh, or misunderstanding uh, lab results, failure to act on the results of monitoring or testing. Example being potassium study uh, showing 6.7 serum potassium, you want to urgently act on that uh, rather than simply file it away. Uh, treatments, treatment errors can occur, errors in the preparation of the treatment like dosage, and we saw examples of that earlier, delayed treatment or inappropriate care, another classification. The uh, failure to provide prophylactic treatment or preventive, uh, uh, preventive errors, that can occur, inadequate follow-up of treatment as an example, or inadequate monitoring during anesthesia. And then other examples are available, failure to communicate, particularly in the chart, equipment failure, situated environments, especially the operating room in ICU where there are special considerations, especially for ill patients and a lot of technology. Here is a cartoon. The doctor says, it seems we had a mix up with your test results. And Dilbert on the left says, then I'm not dying. The doctor says, we doctors are amazingly smart, but occasionally we make a little error. And Dilbert says, well, I understand. And then the doctor goes on, by the way, your pap smear was normal. Now, Swain and Goodman has come up with some human error categories that can be applicable not only to medicine, but to general life. An error omission, for example, might be a typographical error, as I've shown here. An error of commission might be hitting your thumb with a hammer when building something at home. An extraneous act would be, for example, reading the wrong report. A sequential error might be lighting a fire before opening the damper if you have a fireplace. And a timing error might be running a red light when you're driving your car. So these are all examples of human error categories and they can be applied to medical uh, situations as well. An error of omission, forgetting to give a muscle relaxant before intubation. Error of commission, giving a beta blocker to a bradycardic patient. An extraneous act, drawing up drugs not needed. Sequential error, giving drugs before checking your equipment. And a timing error, giving succinylcholine to an awake patient. Examples of uh, drug-related errors in this particular classification. So let's take a look at drugs in the workspace and how the workspace might be better organized for this particular set of goals. One of the things we can do is improve drug and syringe labeling. And it turns out that the International uh, Organization for Standardization, the ISO, has come up with a variety of recommendations and there are others as indicated in the references below. Another challenge is sleep deprivation, particularly among residents. In response to concerns about patient safety as a consequence of resident sleep deprivation from overwork, in 2003, the ACGME, which uh, handles graduate training for medical residents and, and interns, the enacted rules which limit resident duty hours to a maximum of 80 hours per week and set other restrictions, such as a 24 hour limit on continuous duty time with an additional added period up to six hours for transfer of care and educational activities. And so these restrictions hopefully made it easier to uh, have residents carry out their training and operate efficiently. The ACGME rules also require a minimum of 10 hour rest period between duty periods so they can get some sleep and require programs to give residents at least one full day off for patient care responsibilities every week. After all, they have to go and buy groceries and that kind of thing, and they need a day off for that. These regulations are based on well-supported concerns that sleep loss affects cognitive and clinical performance and possibly, in fact, likely patient care. One starting point for many of these changes was a famous American case out of New York called the Libby Zion case. In 1984, Libby Zion was an 18-year-old college student admitted to New York Hospital 
suffering from fever and agitation. The junior resident caring for him made a diagnosis of viral syndrome with hysterical symptoms during his 22nd hour of work. When Libby Zion thrashed violently throughout the night, the exhausted resident ordered meparidine uh, or Demerol, uh, a drug that is contraindicated for patients receiving MAO inhibitors, which Libby Zion was taking. And the next morning she was dead. Uh, you may also know meparidine as pethidine. And not many people are getting MAO inhibitors anymore, but remember this was 1984, and the SSRIs and the other drugs often used for the treatment of depression were not then available. Believing that hospital negligence had killed his daughter, Sidney Zion, a newspaper columnist, a lawyer, well-connected New Yorker sued, charging that clinical experience and resident fatigue were responsible. Residency training in New York State was substantially altered as a result with duty hour limitations and augmented supervision as a result and increased the number of residents as well. For those interested in more uh, information on human error in medicine, there is a couple of articles here uh, and there are many more recent ones as well. These are some of the ones that were leading the movement some 30 years ago. An important aspect to drug delivery is medical ergonomics or medical human factors. I'd like to uh, comment on that a little bit. Uh, drug delivery ergonomics is concerned with the safe and efficient delivery of drugs from the supplier all the way to the consumer. consumer. So for suppliers, it deals with drug distribution, warehousing, storing the drugs, putting them in medical offices and cabinets and so on. For consumers, uh, we're concerned with patients, with hospitals, clinic, medical offices, the narcotics cabinet, and so on. We wanna make sure that the arrangements and the ergonomics are appropriately done. And so I can offer you here 10 uh, drug ergonomic principles that can be useful to reduce the likelihood of drug error. And these are shown here, and I'd like to go through them all with you. First of all, principle number one, the labeling should be clear, unambiguous, sufficiently large fonts, and good print contrast. Secondly, special warnings or instructions should be highlighted and prominently displayed on the packaging. For example, maybe sedating, avoid heavy machinery, shake well before use. Uh, and another example of that uh, I would offer is that uh, on vancomycin, when you give that, it would be helpful if there were a drug label right on the package saying, do not deliver as a bolus to be delivered over one hour for vancomycin as an example. What about product identifiability? The products uh, such as tablets should have a unique marking, marking to allow patient recognition. All products should have a product code, a lot number, an expiry date, and a comment on the route of administration. Secondly, or thirdly, the generic name of the drug should be prominently displayed on the drug label, and I gave you an example of that earlier. Secondly, the drug brand name, if displayed, should not be expected to result in the drug being misidentified with another drug or with a generic drug. Next, for tablets and other oral dosage forms, the dose of each tablet should be clearly stated, but not necessarily as tablet markings. Tablets should be marked with a unique identifier. Labels for drugs in liquid form should clearly indicate the concentration and volume. Next, the strength of the product should have predominance over the number of units in the package. Next, the drug packaging should not present a safety hazard to users. And this is where glass ampules that totally disintegrate when opened can be a problem. And I've seen many anesthesiologists with cut fingers as a result of that. And finally, we want to address special needs that can occur. Uh, patients with limited vision, patients with arthritis, uh, childproof containers. Uh, these are all special issues that have to be dealt with, particularly when providing uh, uh, prescriptions for outpatients. Additional suggestions, label adhesive should be colorless, barcodes if used should not interfere with label legibility. There should be a high level of contrast between the print and the uh, background. Uh, don't use transparent glass as the print background. Um, what about some violations of sound drug principles? Hard to read, uh, drug ampule labels, unlabeled syringes, difficult to find generic names, confusing brand names. These are all things that uh, we want to uh, deal with. And then there are a number of challenges that we need to deal with in the future that I'd like to bring to your attention. 
Uh, we need to disseminate information such as I've done about the ergonomic principles of drug delivery, support research into further understanding of drug errors, have an internet accessible anonymous reporting system for drug errors with links to other interest groups and elimination of confusing brand names. That uh, brings an end to the discussion and uh, I hope you enjoyed this presentation. And I certainly hope that you're able to bring on the message about drug safety to all your friends and colleagues and particularly those people you are training. Thank you again for your time. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Lloyd, for the lecture. Um, I myself enjoyed it very much and uh, going through the lecture, I couldn't agree more calling it like uh, horror stories. We have all been in like holding an apple in our hand and then reading the name to find it a very different drug than what we intended to give. And many of us are guilty of the horror stories, especially when we're trying to write medicines at the end of the shift, it's usually a bad handwriting. Uh, we have uh, one question from Dr. Mohammed Suleiman. He is asking, um, uh, some ampules are able uh, in, with very small writing that is difficult to read, with, especially with COVID drug from abroad companies with unfamiliar design added the problem. Uh, stressful environment during the COVID uh, period increased the risk of drug errors. Uh, do you have a comment on this situation? Yeah, so, uh, it's an unfortunate situation and to deal with it, it's necessary to contact the appropriate regulatory authorities and send them a letter, for example, uh, or send them a phone call or uh, an SMS letting them know that this is a problem, particularly if you're able to photograph the ampule or vial in question, that uh, can bring it to their attention. There are discussion forums where you can do this, but contacting the regulatory authorities is the first step for a process. And that doesn't result in immediate changes. The other thing you can do, of course, is contact your own pharmacy department and ask them to add additional information onto the ampules and vials by way of a tag. And this is sometimes done with additional information uh, when um, this is needed. It's just a matter of attaching a tag onto the ampule or vial um, with some adhesive. Mm -hmm. uh, one more question from Dr. Mohammed Suleiman again. Uh, do you suggest the use of one language, for example, English, irrespective of the nationality of the producing companies? That's a very hot political question. And so I really couldn't give a good answer. Uh, <laughs> Number one, uh, while that may work in the United States, it almost certainly would not work in China, where um, in many regions of China, uh, uh, Cant uh, Cantonese or Mandarin are the only languages spoken, and English would not be something that could be useful. Uh, even, even in China, the question is, well, if you had to pick one language, would it be Mandarin or Cantonese? So it's a complex question, and I certainly don't answer. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Roy, for the lecture. I don't think we have, no, there's one more question popping uh, professor, uh, um, from Ahmed Khattab. He's asking, should we apply obligatory QR or barcodes on each ampoule with electronic reading instruments? That is an excellent suggestion. And you don't even need electronic reading instruments. You just need your iPhone or your um, your other smartphone, and it will read it automatically. So I suggest barcodes, QR codes, not just on drug ampules um, with a little paper attachment, but also on the anesthesia machine where you can immediately get additional information about, for example, how to do your machine check. Uh, mm -hmm. Or if you have a blood warmer, uh, a little QR code on that showing how to uh, particularly assemble it. It's so easy to do, it really is. Um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Doyle, for the uh, important, interesting lecture for your time. Uh, no more questions up to the moment. If anything pops, we'll ask you uh, later in the session. Uh, now we have uh, our next um, session. Uh, it's um, a topic I think uh, it's important for uh, every anesthetist, intensivist, even and not any other specialty of anesthetics. No one of us hasn't been faced with a blood gas to read, interpret, and manage a patient accordingly. So now with uh, Dr. Adil Hamada, 
uh, he is a professor, um, uh, he's a pulmonary medicine consultant. He is an assistant consultant at uh, KAMC, Mecca, KSA, and he will give us a lecture now on um, ABG, a simplified approach of acid-based disorders. Uh, Dr. Hamada, would you start, please? Uh, thank you, Dr. Hoda, for your kind presentation. And uh, thank you, Dr. Saad, again, for giving me this chance again. Uh, we'll start now. Is it appearing or not uh, appearing? The... No, we, we we can see your screen. Yeah. It's not shared yet. Not shared? You can click the green button, please. Here. Green button in the middle of the screen down. Yes, but the... the... the you, you have... Yes. Yeah. The skin has been wiped. No, um, everything is the same like what you did before. Yes, uh, I'm sorry for this. No, it's fine. That's fine. Just uh, click, click the green button, please, in the middle, and it will show you the difference. Yeah, it's good, man. Okay. Yes, yeah, good, man. Yes, we can Thank see. Thank you. Okay. That's perfect. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Uh, we'll start uh, by this uh, important topic, which uh, which is a fair bad gas analysis, which is a topic that facing uh, a lot of physicians uh, from uh, internist uh, uh, anesthesiologists and ICU physicians. Oh. Our slide of our topic will discuss today the basic principles of arterial bed gas interpretation as regards the acid base status, the correlation between the arterial bed gas acid base status and the clinical context of the patients, the concept of the and how to apply all these concepts in our clinical practice. Establishment of correct diagnosis of acid base status, especially in mixed acid base disorder, be challenging. Despite that, accurate and timely interpretation of an acid-based disorder can be life-saving. What are the that the arterial bed gas can provide to us? Really, the net out of data that can be uh, withdrawn from the arterial bed gas. First, data about oxygenation, ventilation, acid-based status, hemoglobin, and types of hemoglobin, glucose, electrolytes, and lactate. What about the normal parameters of arterial bed gas? The normal parameter of pH is from 738 to 742, and in some uh, literature from 735 to 745, CO2 from 38 to 42, and bicarb from 22 to 26. The arterial oxygen tension uh, usually should be above 80 millimeter mercury, and saturation above 95%, and the uh, our arterial oxygen gradient should be age divided 4 plus 4, and lactate should be less than 1.6 millimole per liter. There is some difference between arterial and the venous blood gas. With venous blood gas has lower pH and a little high PCO2 and bicarb. Some definitions. Uh, acidemia, it, it, it relates that arterial pH is below the normal range, and alkalemia, it relates that the arterial uh, pH above the normal range. Acidosis is the process that lowers the extracellular fluid pH, either respiratory or, or metabolic. And alkalosis is the process that raises the extracellular fluid pH, either respiratory or metabolic. This is an example for that. A patient with DKA, DKA is the primary metabolic acidosis, may have hypocapnia from pneumonia which is primary respiratory alkalosis. That may lead to either acidemia, alkalemia, or normal pH. This 
will be determined according to the relative change of carbon dioxide and by carb uh, concentration. If we have more by carb, there will be alkalemia. If we have more carbon dioxide, there will be more. And if both are balanced, we have normal pH, despite we have metabolic and respiratory acid base order. So this is a process, either uh, acidosis or alkalosis, maybe caused by respiratory, either increase or decrease of carbon dioxide, or metabolic by increase or decrease of bicarb, that leads to pH change. And according to the balance between these two processes, we have the pH maybe normal, has acidemic or alkalemic side. Simple acid base disorder, which means involvement of, of a single primary abnormality, either respiratory or metabolic, only one acid base disorder. For example, we have respiratory acidosis. So the increase in CO2 lead to decrease in the pH. Sometimes this primary disorder has, uh, the body will defend uh, to, to, uh, to reach normal pH. This defense by making compensation. So in this, if we have like metabolic acidosis, like in this example, and there is increase in the acid and decrease in the pH, the respiratory tract will be stimulated to make uh, CO2 wash, and this will decrease the pH. And this is still primary disorder, but has compensation. or mixed uh, acid base order, which means there are two primary abnormalities. Like in this example, we have both metabolic acidosis and respiratory acidosis, which, which lead to uh, severe acidemia. Henderson equation and the consistency of the arterial blood gas. Henderson, Henderson equation states that hydrogen ion concentration equal a constant multiplied by uh, by carb divided carbonic acid, where uh, the constant is 24. We can replace uh, carbonic, uh, 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 the, the carbonic acid by BCO2, and the bicarb will be the bicarb. So hydrogen ion by Henderson equation equal 24 multiplied arterial carbon dioxide tension divided the bicarb concentration. Hydrogen ion also can be deduced from the pH. And this, is, this table show how with every pH has certain hydrogen ion concentration. For this example, at pH 740, the hydrogen ion concentration is 40 nanomole per liter. And from 730 to 750, the hydrogen ion concentration, we can calculate it like 80 minus the two digits after decimal point of EBG. This means, like in this example, we have BH is 730. If I, uh, if I subtracted this 30 from 80, it will give me 50, which is the concentration of hydrogen ion. In this example, the same. If I uh, 80 minus 50 here will give around 30, which is the concentration of hydrogen ion. Both the hydrogen from the pH be nearly the same. Are or nearly the same, there is problem with the consistency of the arterial blood gas. So to assure that the arterial blood gas is consistent and accurately recorded, so I can interpret it. There is these two examples in this patient. I should, we will compare the hydrogen ion concentration calculated by the pH and the Henderson equation. Here in this example, the, the hydrogen ion equal 42 uh, by Henderson equation and by the pH equal also 42. So this EBG, I can depend on it and I can, I can interpret it. But here, if I, could, if I calculate the hydrogen ion by Henderson equation, it will be 46.8. And if I, uh, if I calculated it by the pH, it, it will equal 38. There is huge difference between both. So this EBG is inconsistent 
and inaccurately reported. I cannot depend upon it. There are simple steps in EBG interpretation, and if I follow these steps, actually I will interpret the EBG and I will not miss any diagnosis. See this, this uh, normally appearing uh, uh, arterial blood gas. This normally appearing arterial blood gas has at least two uh, acid disturbance, and we'll see later how we can detect it. So EBG interpretation uh, can give us data about oxygenation, ventilation status, and acid base status. And with this uh, lecture, we'll discuss the acid base status. Take good history and uh, patient well. Second, we should uh, uh, take the consistency of the these take the primary disorder. After that, we check for compensation. Are there compensation or not? And if this compensation is uh, the, the same as expected or more or lower than the expected. After that, we should check the anion gap and other gaps. And this will detect degree of compensation and will detect presence of other primary or mixed disorders. First step, history and examination, I should uh, uh, stress on underlying medical condition is the patient has past history of diabetes, respiratory disease, vitals is the patient has is in shock state, uh, consciousness is the patient conscious or not, signs of infection and sepsis, respiratory status, if the patient has uh, GI symptoms like vomiting or diarrhea, what is the, the past and the current medications the patient has taken, and are there in a signs of intoxication? Second, we will check the internal consistency of the ABG as discussed before. Comparing the hydrogen ion uh, uh, that has been reduced from the Henderson equation and the pH. Third and the fourth step, we'll see about the pH, the PCO2, and the bicarb. Here in respiratory acidosis, there will be increase in the CO2, which is the primary uh, defect. So the pH will decrease, and the body start to increase by carb as a step for compensation. When the by carb has been increased more, the pH may decrease to approach normal level in chronic respiratory acidosis. And this will take around three to five days to make for compensation by the kidney. The same in respiratory alkalosis. The, C, the primary defect is decrease in carbon dioxide. So the pH will increase and the bicarb will be lost by the kidneys. With more uh, loss of bicarb, the pH start to approach normal level. In metabolic acidosis, the primary defect will be decrease in bicarb. So the pH will decrease and this will stimulate the respiratory center to hyperventilate and decrease carbon dioxide. And this will uh, make pH approaching a normal level. In metabolic alkalosis, there is increase in the bicarb. This will increase the pH. And the respiratory center will be depressed. And there will be some element of hyperventilation that will increase the carbon dioxide to correct the pH. So we see that all the compensation, it's aim to normalize the pH either in respiratory or metabolic disorders. Second, uh, the next step will check for compensation. For compensation, we should set zero point from which we, we will calculate uh, about compensation. The zero point will be for, for uh, carbon dioxide will be 40. We know the normal limit is from 38 to 42. So we'll, we'll choose 40 for to be zero point, and the bicarb is 24. This is a zero point we'll calculate for compensation. Here in metabolic acidosis, there is uh, one third the formula. So every uh, for PCO2 the, in metabolic acidosis, when we have metabolic acidosis, the predicted PCO2 equal 1.5 multiplied by carb plus eight plus or minus two. 
in metabolic alkalosis, the PCO2 increase uh, 0.6 millimeter mercury per milli equivalent rise in bicarb. And in respiratory acidosis and respiratory alkalosis, we have either acute or chronic, and we have a lot of equations and numbers. But it is simple calculation as here. We will arrange all the acid-base disorders alphabetically, acute respiratory acidosis, acute respiratory alkalosis, and so on. This is alphabetical order, okay? And this is the delta PCO2 from 40. I will fix this to be 10, okay? So in acute respiratory acidosis, every increase of 10 above 40 will increase by carb by one above 24. Like if CO2 is 50, so I have delta PCO2 is 10. Suppose in acute respiratory acidosis, the increase in bicarb will be one. So the exhibited bicarb will be 25. In acute respiratory alkalosis, every decrease in CO2 by 10 will decrease by carb by, by two. So if I have like CO2 30 millimeter mercury, the expected uh, bicarb in acute respiratory alkalosis will be 22. In chronic respiratory acidosis, if the respiratory acidosis has been more than three days, like three, uh, four or five days, the compensation is high. So if I have like CO2 50, the increase in bicarb will be 3.5. If I have like 50 CO2, the, the expected bicarb should be 30 to uh, 27.5, and so on. In metabolic acidosis, nearly every every decrease in bicarb by, by one will be, there will, there will be around decrease by one from the CO2. So if I have like in metabolic acidosis and the, the bicarb is 15 or, or 14, the expected CO2 will be around 30. And in metabolic alkalosis, every increase by 15 in uh, bicarb will lead to increase in CO2 by 10. After that, we should check for anion gap. Anion gap represents the unmeasured anions. It equals sodium plus bicarb and chloride. And normally it is from eight to 12. Must be calculated even in apparently normal EBG. If the EBG even apparently normal, I should calculate the anion gap. And also, it should be corrected with low albumin. So albumin is neg negative charge protein. When it is low, it will lower the anion gap. There is equation for correction. The corrected anion gap equals the anion gap plus 2.5 multiplied by 4.4, which is the normal level of albumin, minus observed serum albumin. After that, I should check for delta ratio. Delta ratio equal the change in, uh, in the in the anion gap divides the change in the bicarb. So, if I have like anion gap is uh, uh, twenty, so the increase above twelve will be eight. So delta anion gap is eight. In pure anion gap metabolic acidosis, I the increase in the anion gap should have the same nearly in the decrease in bicarb. So if I have like 20 uh, anion gap, so the delta anion gap will be eight, I should have decreased by eight in the bicarb. So the expected bicarb should be 16. And if I have delta ratio around one, this is pure anion gap metabolic acidosis. So when anion gap is around one, from 0.8 to 1.2. So this is an ion gap acidosis only. If it is lower than this, so the, de the, the decrease in bicarb in, is more. So there is another acidosis, but not an ion gap. So if the, the delta ratio is from 0.3 to 0.7, there is associated non anion gap metabolic acidosis. And if it is more than 1.2, this means that uh, the, the decrease in CO2 is less than increase in ion gap. This means there is associated either metabolic alkalosis or the bicarb is increased 
from respect to the SLUs before. So these are the six, six steps in interpretation of uh, arterial blood gas. First, history, physical examination, a check consistency of EBG, pH, pco 2 and bicarb. We check for compensation and should check an iron gap and other gaps. Approach to metabolic uh, acidosis. Uh, first, uh, metabolic acidosis either can cause the, by an iron gap metabolic acidosis or non anion gap metabolic acidosis. The cause of an iron gap metabolic acidosis means that the body has excess acid, either endogenous or exogenous. Endogenous acid like diabetes or starvation, oxygenous like alcoholics, uh, uremia, salicylate, alcohols, increase in lactate, and ethylene glycol. The non anion gap metabolic acidosis caused by loss of bicarb, like in urethrosigmodistomy, uh, increase in saline, early renal failure, diarrhea and pancreatic fistula, supplements like in TPN with the chloride, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, amino acids, and renal tuber acidosis. So if we feed metabolic acidosis by the pH and PCO2 and by carb, I should go through the steps. First, clinical context of the patient, if the EBG is consistent or not. We have EBG with metabolic acidosis. We have an iron gap, and I should correct it for albumin for tick. Is it if it more than 12 after correction with albumin? So there is an iron gap metabolic acidosis. So if we, we have an iron gap metabolic acidosis, I should check for delta ratio, either for around one, less than 0.8 or more than 1.2. If it is around one, it is only an iron gap metabolic acidosis. If it is from 0.3 to 0.7, it is not an iron gap. There is associated non iron gap metabolic acidosis. So we have two primary disorders. And if it is more than 1.2, we either have metabolic alkalosis or increase of the bicarb due to chronic respiratory acidosis. If the delta ratio, if there is, uh, after delta ratio, I should uh, check for Osmar gap, which is normally less than 10. This is the calculated osmolarity plus the measured osmolarity. If it is more than 10, this means that, that there is um, uh, osm osmotically active com uh, compound in the blood, like toxins. After that, I should check for compensation, if this metabolic acidosis compensated or not. If normally the expected BCO2 is metabolic acidosis to, to be low, if I found it normal or high, so there is also another primary respiratory acidosis. If it is low, I should calculate the compensation as before. If it is higher than expected, so it is primary respiratory acidosis. If it is the same as expected, there is no respiratory disease uh, disorder. And if it, is, if it is lower than expected, there is associated primary respiratory acidosis. This is an example. A 24-year-old man with diabetes, CKD, is admitted with altered mental status and the hyperglycemia. Blood ethanol was negative. Ketone was positive in urine and positive opioid in urine. This is the EBG. First, I will check the consistency of the ABG. I will calculate the hydrogen ion by Henderson equation, which equal 24 multiplied by the PCO2 divided by the actual bicarb, and compare it with the hydrogen ion used from the pH. If they are equal, so it is valid. And this, in this example, it is valid. Here, the pH is low, so there is acidosis. The PCO2 is low and bicarb is low. This is metabolic acidosis. I should check for an ion gap. I should uh, sodium minus bicarb and chloride. It will be 16. After that, because we have hypoalbumia, I should correct it. After correction, it will be 21. So this is an iron gap metabolic acidosis. After that, I will check the delta gap. Delta gap is uh, the increase 
in the anion corrected anion gap above 12, which is 9. And the bicarb has decreased from uh, 24 to 12. So the delta bicarb is, is 12. So the delta ratio is 0.7. So this patient has also non anion gap metabolic acidosis. After that, I should uh, I should calculate the expected carbon dioxide. The expected carbon dioxide. This there is in uh, there is in this the the bicarb ha has been decreased twelve. So the decrease in CO two will be twelve also. So the expected CO two is twenty eight. Here in the ABG, the CO two is thirty five. It is above the expected. So there is also a respiratory acidosis. So in this EBG, we have three primary acid base disorder. We have anion gap metabolic acidosis, we have non-anion gap metabolic acidosis, and we have respiratory acidosis. Approach to metabolic alkalosis. The cause of metabolic alkalosis will be either chloride or saline responsive or chloride or saline resistance. The chloride responsive mainly in volume depleted patient, like in vomiting, nasogastric loss, villus adenoma, diuresis, and in post-hypercapnic patient. The saline resistance, this is with uh, usually volume uh, non-depleted, either hypertensive or normotensive, and hypertensive like in hyperaldosteronism, Cushing, or oxygenous mineralocorticoids, or normotensive patients like in severe hypokalemia or milk alkyl syndrome. So our approach, first, clinical context of the patient. Second, we check internal consistency. And if we have faced the EBG with metabolic alkalosis, we should also, even we have metabolic alkalosis, we should also check for anion gap and the correct f Anion gap, checking is a must in all EBGs. After that, we'll see the, the PCO2. If the what expected from metabolic alkalosis, they expected that there is CO2 retention, the CO2 will increase. If we have low or normal CO2, this means we have primary respiratory alkalosis. If it is high, we will check for compensation. If the compensation is lower than the expected, so it is primary respiratory alkalosis. If it is like the expected, there is no respiratory disorder. If it is above the expected, there is primary respiratory acidosis. A check of urinary chloride. If the urinary chloride is less than 20, this means that the patient is volume depleted and this is saline, rep saline responsive. If the chloride is more than 20 millimol per liter, this is saline resistance, metabolic alkalosis. Cause of respiratory acidosis, either problem with the drive or the pump, or the affected organs, drive like drugs, morphia, hypothyroidism, metabolic alkalosis, structure CNS region, or idiopathic alveolar hypoventilation, or problem with the, bulb, uh, with the pump like in chest wall or neuromuscular disease, or in affected organs like COPD, left ventricular failure, severe ARDS, and severe asthma that lead to muscle fatigue and C2 retention. Another example a 23 year old man presented with generalized malaise and vomiting. His EBG is shown. This EBG is like the first one we have presented early in the lecture. It appears like normal EBG, but we'll see. The, the consistency after calculation of the hydrogen ion is consistent. What is this order? We have the pH is no, nearly normal, CO2 is nearly normal, the bicarb is nearly normal, so I should go for an ion gap. An ion gap, when calculated, it is high, it is 22. So there is an ion gap metabolic acidosis. After that, I should check for delta gap. Delta gap is the increase of an ion gap above 12. It is 10. Delta ratio, the bicarb is decreased by one. So delta ratio will be 10 over one. It will be 10. So there is also metabolic alkalosis. So this patient has a blood sugar of 510 milligrams per deciliter and the ketones in the urine he had diabetic ketoacidosis, which is responsible for his anion gap metabolic acidosis and the vomiting causing his metabolic acidosis with normally appearing blood gas 
and this bad gas has two primary acid base disorder. So please check an iron gap in every EBG. Case number three. This case pH is 745. When you check, it checks the consistency, uh, the consistency, the pH equals 7.45. So the hydrogen ion nearly around 35. And the hydrogen ion by Henderson equation, which is equal to 24, multiplied by CO2, divided by carb equal 44. So they are away from each other. So this EBG is inconsistent, and I cannot depend upon it, uh, depend on it on interpretation. Case number four, this pH is 730. So we have CO2 is high, and bicarb also is high. There is acidosis, and the CO2 is high. This is respiratory acidosis after consistency. So we should check for compensation. So if this respiratory acid is acute, so every 10 millimeter mercury of CO2 will increase by carb by one. And if, if it is chronic, this 20 millimeter mercury increase in CO2 will increase by carb by seven. So, if acute, the bicarbonate should be 26. If chronic, the bicarbonate should be 31. So it, it is a number between, maybe acute on top of chronic respiratory, respiratory failure. The anion gap is three, so there is no anion gap metabolic acidosis. So this is either acute on top of chronic of respiratory acidosis or chronic respiratory acidosis with non anion gap metabolic acidosis. If this is uh, like if it is by exceeded by carb 31, and there's another acid base disorder, like not an gap metabolic acidosis, it will decrease by carb to a little bit to be around 25. So it is the clinical context which determines the accurate uh, EBG interpretation. In conclusion, a normal pH indicates either normal acid base or combined acid base disorders. The clinical context should be considered in interpretation of acid base status. The corrected ion gap to albumin must be calculated in every EBG, even if it is normally appearing. A high ion gap with normal ketones, lactate, and general function usually points to drug intoxication. Thank you, and thank you for your time. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Hamada, for um, an important topic made as easy as possible. I know it's very difficult to put this effort in a blood gas analysis. Um, we don't have any questions. I think this is because the, the ease and uh, comprehensive nature of your lectures. Thank you very much for that. Um, thank you, uh, panelists. Thank you, attendees. And now back to Dr. Saad for the end of our session today. Thank you. Thank you very much for all uh, colleagues attending tonight. And we are very successful. And thank you very much for almost 115 people so, so supporting the program tonight. Thanks for all uh, panelists and speakers, uh, Rob John Doyle, Dr. Adam Hamad, and Dr. Hoda, uh, for supporting the program tonight. And hopefully we see you next week. Next week we have a very, very strong program about um, acute uh, kidney uh, injury. So uh, stay with us, and we have five lectures next week. Thank you. Good night.